uh, Red Hill, Red Hill, it, it, it throws consternation all over the place. Red Hill, it's a big controversy now. Um, you got to remember that the Red Hill storage tanks date back to World War II. Been there all this time, and maybe that's the problem um, because they have to be maintained in order to contaminate, contaminate the water supply. And there have been you know complaints over the years, a little here, a little there, and they're kind of a crescendo of complaints, if you will, and maybe a crescendo of contamination too. Um, and now the public is definitely in. And two of the people who were involved in, in the controversy in, in the public um, response to all of this. Uh, so um, can you tell me um, you know, what the current status is? Because let me say that the status moves almost every day. And there's a lot of press on this. Um, and it seems to be, you know, uh, as I said, a crescendo. So Melanie, where, where are we now on this controversy um, in terms of the positions expressed by you know, the, the people who are actively opposing further use of these tanks, um, the government, the state government, and the military, the federal government as well. Where are we? Um, well, thank you for inviting us on the program. I think the, the, a little bit of back, excuse me, a little bit of background is, you know, everybody knows about the tanks now. In the, in the beginning, nobody knew about it. Um, not very many people know about it, except, you know, after the leak in 2014. But lately, because of all of the events, it's in the public news. I think every, almost everybody on Oahu at least knows about it now because our aquifer feeds everyone on Oahu. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so yeah, I think it's moving daily actually. And actually I, I've been having a hard time keeping up with it as well, but I know the military families are really affected. They've been having to stay away from their homes um, and you know their water, water is being brought in for them. There's the second, halava shaft that the military has decided to stop their halava shaft. We've already also stopped our board of water supply halava shaft pumping so that hopefully whatever plume is in the aquifer does not keep moving towards what feeds, you know, 500,000 people in Honolulu. Um, does this that, big question, Melanie, does this right? contamination affect the water in all of Oahu or just in that neighborhood? Well, it's all of Oahu. In terms of South Oahu, if you look at the Board of Water Supplies map, which Ernie had put out, I think probably a few days ago. Anyway, um, you follow the blue lines, and the blue lines go all the way from Wanalua Valley to Mauna Lua, is like how they like to say it, all the way to Hawaii Kai, which means it goes through downtown as well as Waikiki. Um, and you know, those are the money generating areas of Oahu. Um, so they say they feed about 400,000 customers with that aquifer and the aquifer. So it's like, I like the analogy of two straws drinking out of the same cup. So the military's shaft is the same as, is drinking out of the same aquifer as the halava shaft that we get our water. Okay, well, Francis, uh, you know, uh, what's your interest in this? I mean, why have you come to the point of well, I sort of answered a call from the Sierra Club. They requested letters to the editor about the subject. So I'm a, a chronic uh, writer, so I decided to jump in. Uh, my letter got published, and then I think that's how Melanie found out about me. Uh, so she realized that I was identify myself as a Moana Lua resident. So she called me, and uh, ever since then, we've been involved in uh, trying to get this thing corrected. Uh, Melanie is the one that's been mo most active the longest. Uh, she has a long history with this matter. I'm, I'm sort of a newcomer, but I am uh, very much interested in getting this thing finally resolved uh, through whatever means I can. Um, I just had a second letter to the editor published about the same subject. So, yes, uh, publicly, I'm one of the advocates. Oh, so, um, in terms of those letters and your view of it, and you said getting it resolved. What is the resolution that you would see? Well, I think both of us agree that the, the final solution is to get rid of the fuel from above the aquifer. Because as long as the uh, fuel is there, regardless of whether operations have ceased, if the fuel is still there, there's always a possibility it's going to leak. And there is a long history of numerous leaks. I think the uh, Board of Water Supply counted like 73 over the history of the uh, the tanks and um, we've had 
two already this year, um, one, one in November. And of course, the one that uh, brought the attention to the public was the uh, 2014 leak of 27,000 gallons. It's, uh, it's been an unending uh, horror story about constant leaks with this uh, operation. So um, if the fuel is above, if the fuel from the tank is above the aquifer, then it will get into the entire water system for the, for the city and county, one way or the other. And so my, my question is, um, um, how do you stop leaks like this? It, I guess the solution you're talking about is you, you pump out all the fuel from all the tanks that are vertically above the aquifer. Um, and then, and then you have no possibility of leaks because there's nothing to leak from. Is is that what you're seeking? Exactly, exactly. Um, no, no matter what other uh, remedies that the Navy has offered, and to date they've offered such things as you know, double lining the, the tanks, or providing a secondary catchment under it, uh, monitoring. Uh, we know historically that all of these efforts have failed and they will fail in the future. Uh, the Navy has been constantly representing that they have everything under control, that they can fix this problem, but historically they have failed in every respect. And unfortunately, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the program, there is a matter of trust that has uh, a developed uh, distrust on the part of whatever the Navy says. So I think everything that they have said so far, you gotta, and so what a green us out. Well, let's let's go to that. Melanie, what about the, 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 the status of trust that Francis talks about? What what is the level of trust now and how did it get there? Well, I think um, our congressional leaders and our local leaders have always had a difficult time, like Marty Townsend said, threading the needle. They need to they want to, you know, keep Navy's money here. Navy is probably, I think, our second biggest employer or something, they said, something like that. So you don't want to, quote, chase the Navy away. On the other hand, we only have one aquifer. And so once you follow the aquifer, half the island will be without, you know, potable water. And so now what are you going to do? So you're trying to balance both issues. And to me, they keep... The Navy keeps painting it in black and white, like there's a either or, there's um, no in between ground. And the in between ground to me is that now that we know it really is definitely leaking, whether it is the tanks or the pipes or the nozzles that carry this fuel, we need to remove the fuel first. Get rid of the fuel, get it out of the tanks. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. On the other hand, you cannot fix the aquifer. You cannot bring that water back to, um, you know, to feed the rest of us. So we only got one aquifer. We only have one can. But what they are ignoring is that they do have alternative sites that if they want to keep the tank here, they certainly can. Just put it over somewhere on Oahu that they own that doesn't have the aquifer under it. They even tried to do a relocation study after the, the 2014 spill, and then that went nowhere. The next meeting was, they just didn't talk about it all. They just said, oh, this is too expensive. Or the one they came up with actually, quite insultingly, moved it up the valley, up on the lower valley, and it was still over the aquifer. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't think anybody really learned anything here. So it's that, it's that kind of thing which um, erodes the trust um, between those who would, um, you know, seek a better solution in, in the community and and the Navy, I, I guess. Uh, how, but how do you know that that trust is eroded? Is, is it talking to people? Uh, is the Navy mm, as responsible as it should be? I mean, in, responsive, I mean to say. Are they engaging with you? Are you engaging with them? Where's the trust? No, they don't. They don't. I don't think they engage with any of us. I mean, we have that one fuel tank advisory committee meeting every year, which I actually asked two years ago, could we have it at least twice a year? So now we are, um, and that's the only time they answered to it. They used to have 
public meetings, which they don't have anymore, and they say mm -hmm. it's because of the pandemic. However, we're having a Zoom meeting, so we could have a Zoom meeting as well with the Navy if they would if they would want to allow it. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's Francis and I speaking for ourselves. I don't hear from everybody in town, but you look at the letters to the editor, you look at civil beats letters to the editor, you look at the poor Navy families who are having to deal with this. I mean, I feel like telling Del Toro, you should have just stayed at Halsey Terrace and then you try and bathe with bottled water. And you try I, I want to, yeah, I want to explore water. that in detail with you. Francis, you had a point you wanted to make, and I don't want to cut you off. Right. You, you know, a good example of the lack of trust that has developed is uh, what happened in the past couple of weeks. Uh, we've since learned that uh, on November 27, the uh, Navy had shut down its uh, Halava shaft. And this is before any complaints by military families began to arise, at least became public. And then um, we find out later on that they accused the, the, the state of not acting on it. But the state said they never got that information. And why would the state, the governor in particular, uh, request that the shaft be shut down if he already knew? It just doesn't make sense, you know? The whole, the Navy spokesmen have not been forthcoming. Uh, they have, if you have to use the word, lied about it. Uh, they could have told the BWS or the DOH back when they shut down the shaft that they're closing down so that the Board of Water Supply could investigate and maybe shut down our shaft, which feeds, you know, 400,000 people. So, you know, just that example alone shows that they're, they have not been transparent. Yeah, and it sounds like transparency is a big issue here. So um, uh, what level of transparency, what level of engagement would you seek in order to create an environment? Uh, that's, that's a loaded word in this context, isn't it? Uh, create an environment where you could reach um, some arrangement that would be mutually acceptable, if there is one. Jay, I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm not an engineer, but I think at the very least, there has to be independent monitoring of the, of the wells, uh, independent uh, experts, not relying only on the experts. And yet this brings back the point that was made earlier. The, the Hawaii delegation um, has to rely upon the Navy now for information upon which to make policy decisions. And I can speak that topic because I did serve uh, in Congress uh, on two occasions, once when I first started my legal career and once uh, when I retired. And I know that all of the delegation has to rely upon the military for that information. And that's where we we're end up with this problem, you know, because uh, we're getting bad information, we're getting incorrect information, sometimes dishonest information. So there has to be independent uh, inspections uh, independent monitoring, independent testing. That's the only way we're going to get the correct information to make the right decisions. Can the delegation help you achieve that? I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Spoken directly. Uh... We got to get you back in Congress, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my thing. <laughs> uh, Melanie, I wanted, I, I, as I suggested, I wanted to ask you about how this problem affects lives and how it affects health in a given family, and how it affects public health, and how it affects the future, you know, life expectancy and all that. What are we talking about biochemically here? Well, the fuel, you know, is, is diesel. I, well, not, I should say that, it's just gasoline, I guess, for what, with a better way of saying it. Um, and so really, quite frankly, I don't think anybody's done experiments on gasoline, people ingesting gasoline. Other than that, we know the side effects that the people are feeling, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, headaches, are because they were exposed to ingesting um, the gasoline. But nobody's going to do an experiment and say, okay, what are the long-term effects? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm reading the same newspaper reports that you are, that there's pregnant women um, drinking this water, there were kids bathing in it, drinking it, people were doing it for who knows how long, because maybe it's been even longer than the Navy said. Um, you know, Department of Health has recorded all these leaks since like 1983 or before. Um, you know, there's there's all those long-term effects that we probably don't even know. But if the aquifer is fouled, where are we going to get water for half a million people? 
I mean, they are yeah. having difficulty bringing it in for the 9,000 people that are their troops, which is even sadder because it's their own people and they're like not even taking care of their own people, let alone us. And can you taste it in the water? Can you taste the gasoline, the biochemical? Some people, some people said they did, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and so, um, but it, it depends on what part of the million it's at. The part of the pavilion it's at, whether it can taste it or not, I, I don't know, because that's not my area. Um, but yeah. You, know, you made you made a, a point a minute ago about how families are concerned. So that you know, when when you when you know there's something in the water, a la Flint, Michigan, you know, um, and the lead in the water in Flint, Michigan. Um, aside from the biochemical effects, of the medical effects right. on people and kids and long-term effects that we may not know, you know, what exposure may do over the decades. Um, you get a psychological reaction. Uh, you, get, you get anxiety. Right. And of course, that, that is its own problem. So can you talk about that? Well, I mean, it, look at the pandemic. All of us have been getting anxious for the past couple of years. Um, you know, just even in my own practice, there's more people coming in anxious and having to look for a counselor and be on medication, not want to be on medication, things like that. Now you just compounded it with, I don't know if I poisoned my kids all this year, right? And so all these women, and they don't have the support of their spouse or all these men who don't have the support of their spouse who are, like they were saying, under the sea and don't even know that this is going on. So yeah, it, it's going to be, it's going to be more far-reaching. And if it starts affecting the local population and we have to start foraging for water, that's going to be another problem. We might just be turning against it. No. My next question to Francis, you know, <clears throat> talk about um, moving the tanks to a location, Melanie said, which would also, also be owned by the federal government, by the, by the Navy ostensibly. Um, do we know where that would be? Do we know where, how that would work? Well, it, it's not a, a matter of moving the tanks. The, the old tanks are going to just stay there. We might have to fill them in with uh, concrete or some filler. But um, the other tanks that should be built would be built elsewhere. Uh, there, there was a request by the lieutenant governor, I remember, of a uh, independent um, fuel storage company. And they, they said that with the current capacity, they could probably take about one third of the uh, fuel from Red Hill. And that, that's based upon the you know, full capacity of Red Hill, not, not actual usage. So, and the Navy doesn't tell us how much you know, fuel they actually have in there. They just tell us about the full capacity. So uh, there is some ability in the local community to take some of it. Some of it may be put on tankers. Others could be put on um, temporary, uh, uh, tanks elsewhere, but this is not a, a short-term project. It's going to take a number of years. Uh, the Navy did uh, do this. They did um, uh, decommission underground tanks in two locations on the mainland, one in uh, Point Loma, California, and other Manchester, Washington. And they were able to do it but on a much smaller scale. But um, you know, if uh, we start now, we start construction now, uh, we could get some tanks uh, up and running, uh, I would think, in a few years. Um, you know, it may be too late by then, because I think the aquifer is already contaminated. But let's, we got to get started. Got to get started right away. So what does the Navy say to that? You know, they, they seem to poo-poo any, uh, any other um, proposals other than their own. And their own project uh, won't be done until 2045. And you know we don't have that time to wait. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything else that they propose are minor. They're you know maintenance issues which uh, aren't going to solve the problem because we know from history it hasn't. And um, we can't wait to 2045. Uh, we got to start now. And then if this one company locally said they can take one third of it, then you know there may be others that can take some some other part of the uh, total capacity. Well, you're also, suggesting that, um, that they, these tanks are bigger than they need to be. What, what I mean is uh, there's this excess fuel in there that, that is beyond what the Navy needs to for its uh, ordinary operations. Is that right? How, how do you know that? Uh, who is saying that? Well, you know, uh, can I put in or 
Go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> well, um, so like I said, I've been part of this FTAC committee, and so I actually asked the captain that, and I said, how much fuel do we really need? And he says, oh, I don't know that. You would have to ask PLA. I'm like, okay, but somebody must know this. And I said, well, he said, you should ask your legislator. So I did. I wrote to them. I asked them, and I did not get an answer. I got a form letter back saying, oh, yeah, we're very concerned about the tank. So then I wrote again, and I said, okay, but you didn't answer my question. And then I got the answer that, that oh, that's um, national security secret. And so you don't, we can't tell you how much fuel we actually need. But um, if you look at it logically, we are not, we don't have as many surface ships as we did before in World War II, which is what this was built for. We have more, you know, nuclear powered things. And so I don't think we need as much fuel there. But of course, they're never going to tell me how much is in the tank, how much we really need. Mm -hmm. And we also have RIMPAC coming up this summer, apparently. So we can drain some of the fuel that way and just not refill it. Um, we can use uh, our Hawaii's tanks that, uh, you know, we found that they will take about one third of the capacity. Maybe it's not even at full capacity now. They're not even telling us. I'm not even sure they know themselves. Um, so there are things to do. But the point is that we got to get the fuel out of there as soon as possible. However, probably the tank, the uh, what we call piping and the nozzles are probably not intact. I mean, he is an engineer. He knows that. So he's probably, that's why he said in the form that, you know, you, you, when it's practicable to do, we should probably move the fuel out, but maybe not right now, since if we move it now, we might make a big fill. Makes sense, right? But if we don't keep pushing to remove the fuel, when this is no longer a front page issue, it may go back to the same old, oh, okay, maybe it's possible. we don't have to worry about this anymore, which is what I'm afraid of, and we'll end up with a permanently foul. Yeah. But uh, one thing I, I just want to confirm is that the, the, the Navy is putting, as the fuel is depleted from these tanks, the Navy is putting more fuel in right now. Am I right? Right, right. Except right now they're not because, remember, they suspended operations, right? So I think that means movement of fuel. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. The other, the other thing I want to ask you guys, and I don't, you know, maybe this is an engineering question because at the end of the day, um, expert engineering opinion is going to be relevant no matter which way you go. Um, you know, there's a, there's a fellow at the university by the name of Don Thomas. Thomas is um, he's a, um, a volcanologist, okay? and he has spent a lot of time examining uh, the soil structures uh, on the Big Island. And he has found uh, that although our existing aquifers are relatively close to sea level, uh, there's also water sources in Hawaii uh, that are up in the mountains um, that have untapped water. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever discussed that with you or thought about it, but Don says it's a question of money, of course, but you could tap water in those high level sources, like high altitude sources in the mountains and not have to worry about the existing sources, that is through the aquifers. Has anybody talked about that? Not, not to me directly, but I, I think that would be nice to find and discover, but I don't think that's going to solve I mean, we really depend on that aquifer below us. And even it's already threatened by sea level rise because it's actually not in a contained space. It's, you know, over brackish water. And so the brackish water can rise as sea level is rising. So it's not, you know, in a stable container. I mean, that'd be nice if we could find an alternate source, but I don't think we have time. Right. Time is of the essence, isn't it? In terms of public health, um, in terms of, um, you know, preserving the purity that we have. So uh, I guess, uh, Francis, I'm interested in knowing what, what your organization can do um, in terms of getting and enlisting the support of the delegation in Washington, in terms of enlisting the support of uh, legislators who, who may be interested in, you know, environment um, and, um, you know, water in, in the legislature. For that matter, uh, there's, there's always uh, DLNR. Um, so who could help you, who is helping you in order to make the point here from government point of view, uh, from the point of view of those people who would like to see some government action, um, who, who are the champions here? Who could be the champions? Well, I 
can't speak for the association. Mellon is much more closely um, associated with the organization. But individually, you know, everybody can contact their Congress people, their legislators. Um, they're at all levels, local, state, and, and uh, in, in Washington. And uh, I've made my efforts uh, to contact people that I, I know back in Washington. And uh, I, I found that they're very receptive. Uh, I think there's a realization that this is a crisis. Uh, I think everybody sees the crisis unfolding right now in the past few weeks. Uh, so th th I think there's a, a full on um, approach to uh, get this matter solved and to get the uh, Navy to start working on the problem rather than just talking about it. But I think from an um, association perspective, I think Melanie should respond to that one. Ah, yes, I was fully intended to ask the same question of Melanie. <laughs> Melanie, who are the champions that you would approach here? So I, I think it's a little misplaced to say that our value association should be the champion. I actually think everybody needs to step up to the plate, meaning everybody in Hawaii who finds it, even from the other side. We need to let our legislators know, both in Washington and locally, that we care and this matters to us because it actually does affect everybody in terms of realistically all the way out to, you know, Waikai. So everybody in between should be also concerned about this matter. So, and, you know, Sierra Club has been pushing for the longest time. Board of Water Supply has been also. I know people think of Sierra Club as, quote, a fringe group, so you'd hate to say that, but it's, it's, um, it's actually each individual needs to write and Call and send an email to who? 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 You mean write and call who? Oh, sorry. Oh, so everybody. So Case, that Toronto and Pele. You can start there, and you can also write to Ige, and you can write to your own representative of your district. Um, you know, state and the, the Senate and represent House Rep. You know, in that way, you can let them know it's on your radar. You care, and this, the message is simple. Remove the fuel as soon as possible, um, and then maybe seek alternative storage things, double walled, above ground. It doesn't have to be gravity fed. Um, you know, they keep jacking the deck that way whenever they try to do their alternate studies. It doesn't have to be, but you definitely want an interstitial between the walls that will monitor for heat. You can get to it and stop it before it gets all the way out to the environment. Um, they like cut and cover, they like gravity fed, fine. You can do it at Mokoku Peninsula because that one is not over the Africa. They have lots of land that they own, which I guess is kind of contaminated right now. But anyway, that they could build double wall tanks above ground. And it doesn't I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be gravity fed. That sounds romantic, that sounds sexy, but it's not how we need it anymore. We do have solar powered pumps, we do have nuclear power pumps. So, um, Francis, um, you know, Melanie mentioned uh, climate change. And uh, when I think of water, I, I think of um, a future such as the Colorado River Basin is having right now. Um, it's a lack of water. It's, it's drought. It's changes, uh, unpredictable changes in weather. And uh, maybe in some sense, we're talking about a larger issue here. Um, you know, uh, I remember having a conversation with the Board of Water Supply some years ago. I said, have you, have you guys ever considered, uh, um, 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 what do you call it? Um, Selling to them? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> um, where you, uh, you turn seawater into fresh water. Desalinization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and they said, oh, we have no plan to do that for many decades. It's not time for us to think about that. Well, it's not money either because, um, you know, it cost San Diego uh, billions and billions to do it. They did do it, um, but it was very expensive. So query, you know, what about the possibilities of some of these water, you know, futuresque water solutions, um, you know, in, in terms of the seawater source, in terms of the bladders we hear about, you know, ocean bladders, in terms of, um, you know, some of these larger, uh, civil engineering kinds of solutions, which are maybe not appropriate right now, but which would be appropriate when we reach another stage in, in climate change. Is that part of this discussion? Well, I think right now it, it's really not. 
uh, we're not looking that far ahead. Uh, you know, Hawaii has uh, world-class water, uh, best in the world, um, without the uh, necessity of a lot of chemicals uh, to make it uh, drinkable. Uh, so, you know, we, we had an ideal situation with a great uh, aquifer system of providing um, uh, ideal water for, the, for all purposes. Um, but I guess eventually there, there has to be some effort to look at alternatives, such as desalinization. We live uh, right in the middle of an ocean. There's ample uh, seawater all around us. But, you know, uh, we got to just protect what we have. Um, we have such great assets. And to have uh, one of these uh, beautiful, um, awesome assets get spoiled by just carelessness and irresponsibility, yeah. you know, that, that's unforgivable. It's unacceptable. So uh, that's where our efforts are right now. And uh, I think. Um, Hopefully it's not too late, but if we can reverse um, the irresponsible practices of the Navy right now, perhaps we can save what we do have without having to go to extraordinary means. Uh, well put. So we're at the end of our uh, time, and I want to ask you guys for any, any thoughts you would like to leave with our viewers. Um, you know, what message would you leave with them in terms of how they should see this issue? and what they should do about this issue. Francis, you go first. Well, what comes to my mind right now is uh, the image of the, the tanks. The, the lining of the tanks are supposed to be one quarter inch thick. Right now, in many spots, it's down to one tenth. And even then, the Navy thinks it's enough. It's good enough. It's, it's safe enough. Picture that when you're considering this issue. We are on the verge of, if not, already there, a major uh, calamity. So people got to act right now. There's no time to dilly-dally, no time to think of other less important things. This is our livelihood. This is our economy. Imagine if Waikiki goes down the tube because of bad water. Wait, just think about that. Time to act. Yeah, Melanie, Francis makes a good point because we are at Christmas, and this is um, the Christmas season always reminds me of Charles Dickens and the Christmas Carol and Scrooge. Um, and, um, you know, the, the whole thing about the, the ghost of Christmas future, if you remember. So uh, you know, Francis touched on this, but I want to ask you about it, too. What is the ghost of Christmas future if we do nothing? What will happen? Um, well... If we do nothing, I can see the Navy continuing on its way. And it will, at one point in time, we will have a catastrophic event, and the tank will leak, or the nozzles and the tubes will leak, and we will foul the aquifer. And there'll be, you know, half a million people without potable water. It'll be too expensive to truck it in or actually, you know, load it in. The Navy will say, you know, Hawaii is no longer useful to us. We'll probably sail away and let's find another port. Um, and then leave us without our tourism either, because who wants to come to a Hawaii with no um, potable water? And Waikiki is all done for. So, yeah, I mean, the time is now. People need to step up. Congress appropriates money to the Navy. We got to talk to the congressmen. Congress works. Us. They work for us. I mean, we always tend to think of these people as being too far out of reach, but we are the citizens who vote from there. And so we are the citizens who need to let them know this is important. And we need to have some changes. We're not saying Navy go away. In fact, if we make a ton of tanks, we will we'll employ a lot of people. Right now, it just takes four people to run the tanks. It took 3,900 to make them, and that was in three years. So it's going to take a lot of time to dismantle them, to clean them up, not dismantle them, sorry, to clean them up, um, and then to build new tanks if that's what they want to do here. And I think there's a lot of unions that have a lot of members make money that way. <laughs> the story of Hawaii Nay. <laughs> well, Melanie Lau and uh, Francis Nakamoto, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I think it's very important that people speak up on issues like this. and I. And I admire you for doing so. I hope you get some results from the champions out there in government. Uh, and I look forward to circling back with you later to see how it all goes. 
One thing is clear, we can't forget about it. That's clear. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Thank Francis. You. Thank really you. appreciate you coming on. Aloha. Thank you very much.